Thank you, everyone. And, and lastly, we have uh, Luca Solka, who is a luxury goods analyst for Exade, BNB Paribas. He's been an industry leading analyst for quite some time, um, and he's been over 25 years in the luxury goods industry. And he's going to discuss some of the challenges facing the luxury goods industry at this time. Thank you. My job today is to give you an idea of where the sustainability debate sits among the various challenges that uh, the luxury goods industry is facing today. Uh, the old growth paradigm is, uh, is challenged. This has been uh, based on increasing retail presence all around the world. The number of stores that luxury goods companies operate directly has skyrocketed over the past 20 years. And this, combined with price increases, has provided uh, the bulk of the growth. In fact, when we look at what brought growth to luxury goods companies, we see that space and price, largely, have carried the day for the most part of the past uh, 20 years. Why was this the case? Well, you had a wave of new consumers coming into the market. These have been the Chinese. Uh, they went from close to nothing at the beginning of the noughties to about a third of the market. So for many years, the luxury goods industry uh, was confronted with the challenge of opening as many stores as they could in uh, China and uh, jacking up prices because the early Chinese consumers were very rich and could pay up. Going forward, there's a very different set of challenges. First of all, we need to take into account that the rich Chinese have already bought a very significant amount of personal luxury goods, products they're moving to experiences, they're moving to services, they're uh, going on holiday abroad, they're buying houses in Vancouver and Sydney. The bulk of the new luxury demand is going to come from the middle class and their spending power, that is the bad news, is limited. So the product mix is going to go south. Brands have often gone overboard opening new stores. Uh, network consolidation is going to be very much uh, the name of the game going forward and is happening as we speak. And uh, last but not least, the digital frontier is bringing a whole new set of challenges to luxury goods brands and companies uh, worldwide. Without getting too much into the details, return on invested capital, so the amount of profit that you can get on the amount of money that you invest in your business, is the number one and most important criteria to gauge uh, whether companies are creating value or not. When we look at uh, this paradigm shift, we see that it is challenging the way that luxury goods companies are producing value for their shareholders. In fact, you see that return on invested capital in the most recent years has declined. So there's a, a very significant set of issues uh, connected with that because we uh, show here the correlation of total shareholder returns to return on invested capital. Return on invested capital has to go up, not down, in order to create value for shareholders. It's uh, a very simple relationship and a very and a near perfect one that you see on this chart. So uh, how do you get this uh, trend to move the right way? Now, just a few words on digital. Digital can be a very important opportunity for luxury goods businesses because it allows them to sell products at a significantly lower cost. You don't pay rent in prime locations when you sell on the internet. You don't pay front office staff. So you have higher contribution and you basically add sales on the invested capital base that you already have in place, which is largely in the stores. Now, uh, so digital is less capital intensive and overall uh, this allows you to boost return on invested capital. By the way, when we look at consumers that buy both online and in store, we find that those are the most valuable consumers for luxury brands today. So you give more uh, convenience access to your products. You get people to purchase more often. Digital, after having been opposed uh, for many years, has become the new bandwagon for luxury goods companies. And in the most recent two or three years, have seen 
all of the luxury goods companies having a U-turn on that and deciding to embrace digital as the new priority. By the way, uh, developing digital allows you to know all of your customers by name, not only through that you can get uh, your customers' details also in store, uh, but what this opens up in the future is uh, the possibility of significant CRM activity. You can talk to your customers one by one rather than addressing them today with uh, uh, mass market tools like print advertising. There's a new uh, challenge because luxury goods brands know how to provide a luxury experience in store, but as far as providing that same luxury experience on your mobile or on the internet, this is a different catch of the fish. And what we know is that luxury goods brands, based on research we've carried out, uh, differ widely in the quality of the experience that they currently provide. So uh, getting to grips on how to get the internet to work for luxury goods uh, is uh, a, a big challenge for luxury companies. The future we see is that retail is going to be much more differentiated. Today in luxury you find that the differentiation is largely in the color of the floor that you have in store or in the size of the store. Mine is bigger than yours. But we find that the best in class examples involve developing retail environments that are connected with the DNA of the brand. I wanted to highlight here Apple. Apple stands for simplicity and ease of use. When you go to an Apple store, it's beautiful, and you have a lot of people helping you to use your products even better. So uh, we're, starting to see, uh, we're starting to see more of that in, uh, in, uh, in luxury, but it's, it's just the beginning of that. And I wanted to mention the case of the new Fendi flagship store in Rome, which has a fur manufacturing activity in the store itself that you can see through a glass uh, wall, like in a three-star Michelin restaurant, which is at least uh, giving you a tangible evidence of what the brand stands for. There's a dark side of luxury, too. Uh, there's a dark side of digital luxury. And I think that the most important point that I wanted to bring to your attention today is that digital distribution reduces the barriers to entry for new entrants into the luxury goods uh, market. It is challenging physical distribution in a number of countries. I think the most advanced country as far as digital is concerned is certainly China, and that is a very important test bed for luxury, as I showed before. The Chinese today represent by far the largest nationality in the luxury market. But importantly, uh, it brings the opportunity for new entrants to have an SGNA light, so a cost efficient business model, which has virtually no rent, no administrative cost, and which focuses on providing a very good value proposition based on product content. Today, when you buy anything in a luxury goods store, the retail price you pay is a multiple of eight to 10 times of the cost of producing the product. So there's an opportunity here, there's a price umbrella for new entrants to say, well, you know, I'm gonna give you the same product quality, if not better, but as I don't have to pay rent, I'm gonna be giving you half the price or even a third of the price. That is a very serious challenge, and we've seen it in place in footwear, which I highlight here, as well as in eyewear and in a number of other product categories, including uh, fashion. We expect this is the eyewear brands, and I imagine you're all very familiar with Warby, Warby Parker. There's, there's, there's a host of new brands coming to the market, and some of them are not really small at all. So uh, this is going to be an important, uh, an important driver of how luxury goods companies are going to change their business model going forward in the next five to 10 years. Uh, pressure on newness to stand out and continue to maintain a price premium, gross margin moderation, uh, downward pressure on costs, as well as substance over storytelling. A lot has been said about craftsmanship and about 
the uniqueness of these products that uh, luxury brands bring to the market. Uh, what has not been said is that in most cases these products are produced by somebody else, uh, which is paid cents on the dollars uh, versus the retail price. So we expect more insourcing, we expect more investments in manufacturing as luxury brands will have to test, will have to stand the test of, uh, of what they say with savvier and savvier uh, consumers. We just gave uh, a top-down analysis of how important sustainability is in uh, this uh, need for luxury goods brands to stand out and uh, to become even more desirable going forward. Uh, the way we've carried out this is by analyzing uh, what luxury goods uh, companies and publicly traded luxury goods companies at that uh, say to investors and to the market. We, have, we track words in their annual reports. So experience, as you can see, uh, as consumers have uh, moved to experience from products, has been one of the uh, key words. Uh, and you see the number of times that, that the word experience has been mentioned over the past 10 years by LVMH, Caring, and Richmond. Sustainability, by contrast, uh, has, has been embraced by a number of players, but the number of players that have embraced it in full, apparently, is still limited. In that chart, you see that uh, caring is one of them. In the detail table that I show you here, you see basically uh, Ugo Boss, caring, and Burberry mentioning it um, frequently, Montclair as well, uh, which was probably the company that was referred to before uh, involved and mired in the G's uh, uh, cruelty uh, uh, allegations that, uh, that uh, my colleague was referring to before. Uh, but you see that uh, quite a number of uh, other players uh, are not particularly um, focused on sustainability yet, apparently. Hermès was another very high-profile uh, case of potential misfiring uh, from lacking a sustainability focus. You saw that uh, the famous actress uh, Birkin uh, was uh, threatening to withdraw her name from the famous Birkin MS bag if MS didn't come clean as far as crocodile farming in Australia is concerned. So I expect that sustainability will indeed be one of the streaks uh, that luxury goods brands will try to weave into their fabric. And so without further ado, I would uh, hand over to you.